I was talking with the principal last week and she said, man, it would be great if I could work less than 60 hours. And I realize I've been keeping a secret from you. I do work less than 60 hours at work and it's pretty awesome. I'd like to share that with you because it's so powerful. So if you go to transformativeprincipal.org slash ideal week, you can sign up for my mini course to figure out how you can shave a ton of time off of your work week. And I got to tell you, it's awesome. Emergencies are no longer emergencies. And being planful and mindful has changed the way I work. So go to transformativeprincipal.org slash ideal week and check it out. But before I get to the interview, I want to tell you about something real quick. Each year, TheBestSchools.org presents a $20,000 Escalante Gradillas Prize for Best in Education. The winners of that exemplify a commitment to learning, discipline, character building, and high expectations that characterize legendary math teacher Jaime Escalante and his principal, Henry Gradillas. These two educators helped students excel at East LA's Garfield High School, and their story became the 1988 film Stand and Deliver. Definitely one of my favorites. To celebrate that legacy and the partnership of teachers and school administrators, thebestschools.org awards $10,000 to one outstanding K-12 teacher or school administrator and also a $10,000 grant to the winner's school or district. For 2017, the prize focuses on school administrators, which includes principals, school counselors, in-school curriculum designers, superintendents, and any school or district educators not based in the classroom. The primary criteria for consideration are doing more with less and demonstrably raising student academic performance. Details in the quick nomination form are online at thebestschools.org slash prize. Nominations for 2017 end March 31st, so nominate an outstanding school administrator today. Welcome to Transformative Principal. You are in for a treat today. I have Henry Gradias, the principal of Jaime Escalante, who's going to talk about how he leads in his schools where he's been a principal and he's been a principal of many schools. I, uh, as you've been hearing at the beginning of the podcast, I've been promoting the uh, bestschools.org prize that goes out to great uh, principals and teachers. And this year it's for principals. And so I've been working with the bestschools.org to talk more about that. And I uh, had the opportunity to interview Henry Gradias. And let me tell you, this is a jam-packed, story-filled interview about basically setting high expectations and then actually keeping them. And man, I just loved talking with him. And you're going to really enjoy this interview. We touched on a couple of hot topics for me, things like gifted education and how he's still teaching Spanish as a full-time substitute teacher and he's in his eighties. I mean, it's amazing. One of the great things is that he says so many times other people tell him that it couldn't be done and then he just goes and does it. So anyway, I hope that you enjoy this and I know, you know, a great principal and go ahead and nominate someone for that. The best schools.org prize, because that is a pretty amazing opportunity to get uh, $10,000 dollars as a cash prize from the bestschools.org in honor of the things that Henry Gradias does and did and in honor of the late Jaime Escalante. And if you're on spring break this week, you should probably go rent and watch Stand and Deliver again because it is inspiring. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am so excited and honored to have Henry Gradias, a former principal on the show today. And Henry, thank you so much for being here. From what I understand, are you still substitute teaching? <laughs> In a way, yes. Uh, <laughs> not only a substitute teacher, but I got into a special program of uh, tutoring to help those kids that really need the help to get them through co through the high school into college. Oh, that is awesome. So if you don't know who Henry Gradias is, you probably know who Jaime Escalante is and the movie Stand and Deliver, which was about the time period where Henry Gradias was the principal of Jaime Escalante's school. And uh, there's a fascinating backstory about that. Would you like to give any other biographical information about you, Henry, before we move on? No, other than that, you know, I was uh, born in Santa Barbara. I lived in the barrios of East L.A. Uh, 
all through high school, I uh, was able to get a, a nice scholarship to University of California, Davis, where I majored in agriculture and got themselves a nice paying job before I got into the military. And so you've had a long, full life and done amazing things. And there's a lot of information about you on your website with your background and many of the prizes and things that you've won. One of the things that I wanted to make sure that we talked about today was the bestschools.org prize that they give for excellent administrators and teachers that alternates each year. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement in that and how that came about and what it's for? Well, I think uh, the the greatest thing is recognition. I mean, there are so many people doing so many fine things in education, and some that have done uh, a lot somehow just fall asleep or decide not to. As an example, I knew a teacher that was not doing the work that they should have done, and I went and I said, what's wrong? What's the matter? I was the principal, and I came in to kind of grade him. And after school, we sat and talked. He says, you know, I was a much better teacher, but now, I don't know, things have changed. I don't get the backing. I don't get this, that, the other. And I've just kind of slipped. So I started working with him. And uh, amazingly enough, he did some fantastic work with some kids in, in mathematics. And I gave him a a nice little prize in the, in the teacher's meeting, the faculty meeting. I, I brought him up and I said, here's a, st- a person that, you know, has worked all his life and feels a little down. And look what he's doing now. He's reviving and he's bringing forth all the knowledge he's had. Surely you must have this knowledge, too, in the, in the many years you've taught. So I said, you know, I want to encourage all of you. And as soon as you begin to move these kids in the right direction and give them all the energy that you have or that you had, bring it back, I, too, will recognize you. And we got some nice prizes. And I'm telling you, he felt so good about it that he says, I'm just, I'm like I'm reborn again. So it's stuff like this that, that I'm involved with with the teachers. I mean, they are, after all, the ones that, that produce the, the students. And they must have as much backing as possible and encouragement to finish their work and and continue doing the job. Yeah, and that's that's really awesome. You know, it's one of those things where it's one thing to just tell someone they're doing a good job. It's another thing to really recognize them in an outstanding way. And this prize that is put on by the bestschools.org, people can check out links to that in the show notes and see that. One of the other things about recognition, if you are a listener, you may remember the top 10 manager that I interviewed quite a few months ago. And uh, you can search that out on my website, transformatorprinciple.org, and find other ways that you can recognize people because recognition really is important. And so we want to make sure we recognize those people. So Henry, you have been a principal in many schools and been a longtime leader in education. And things are a little bit different now, like that teacher that you spoke to mentioned. What are some of the challenges that are facing us today that we could use your guidance? in overcoming? Well, the biggest thing is, is, you know, things change. There's no question about it. One of the biggest things back in 1979, 80, they told me, you can't do this anymore because of the regulations and status and whatever is coming up out of the courts. And uh, in the 90s, they told me, well, you can't do this. I became principal of a school here in Michigan. And they said to me, well, you know, you can't adapt some of the things that you did there because it can't be done now. Wherever I go, they say that whatever I did in the past can't be done now in the future. Well, I've been doing that since 1970-some. And this is now. Now, yeah. and every every year I go back and I say, yeah, you probably can't do it exactly the same way, but you can adapt to the to the situation. I mean, I'm a biologist. Uh, that's what I got my degree in, in, in biological sciences. The biggest thing I learned is is, is 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 changing, is evolution. It's moving from one area to other. It's adaptation. Birds will adapt. They move back and forth. They do things. The young. Uh, I mean, uh, this is the species. This is life, and we have to grow with it. And when the problems come up that we're not quite used to or there are problems that we probably didn't have to that extent before then you have to look at that and say well adjust you know i have kids here that that really can't read but i've been working with them and reading and, and establishing courses and classes it isn't that different from what it was before the kids that we have now might be a little different because they're not running around with their iPads and whatever, you Chromebooks and you know what they have and their telephones and all. So we have to adjust to that. We move in that direction. I have certain areas where the kids can do that if they finish. If they don't, then they have to produce. The biggest thing is that I see now is that we there are so many involved kids in other things that there's no concentration on something specific. And I've been trying to do this as an example. 
we lost our Spanish teacher that taught both at the high school and the middle school here in this uh, in this area. And they needed a Spanish teacher to finish out. They couldn't find one. And the subs obviously didn't know Spanish up here in the north. So we had a situation where they asked me, please, can you take over the class and set it up and get grades going until we find someone? Well, it's been six weeks, and they still haven't found someone. And I said, you know, I don't want to be a full-time teacher again at my age, and, uh-huh. but I will help all I can. Well, as I go in there, I see there's there's all these differences in the classroom. I'm not used to kids coming in there with all this uh, electronic equipment. So I said, let's put it away and let's go. And all of a sudden, I have these kids repeating. They just don't understand the language, and they have all these newnesses, and they all have these computers and all this work. They have little cutouts. And I looked at that, and I said, you know, that isn't working, is it? And the kids said, no. So let's go, Roach. Let's do it. Here it is. I want to teach you. 15 different animals. La vaca is the cow. Say it. And they all pronounced it. Do you realize that when I gave that quiz, there wasn't a kid that couldn't pronounce it properly or a kid that missed more than a certain percentage? They all passed the test with A's and B's. Yeah, a few kids went lower only because they were, you know, absent. But you got to go back and say, this is what has to be done. You have a job. You have to teach it. Find a way to teach it nowadays with all this new stuff coming along. And I'm very successful at doing that because the kids understand. Today, we're going to have computers. Today, you work. Let's see. And I walk on there, and I see the computers, and I go, okay, have that lady talk back to you and say the correct words in Spanish. So I'm using today's technology, even though it's bothersome for, for me at times, repeat it. And they send it in, and all of a sudden Google gives it the right pronunciation and everything goes on. And it's just keeping up with the kids. To get rid of the computer, to get rid of it, it's not going to work. These kids are going to hide it. They're going to do it underneath. They're going to they're going to find ways to use it in class. So let's be productive. Use it properly when I need it. And then later on, I'll give you free time. We can go out to the commons and sit there on the outside and enjoy, uh, you know, 20 minutes of relaxation. That's the way I'm winning. And it, it's working. Yeah. Well, that's that sounds pretty amazing. And you still having the energy to be a full-time teacher after your whole career, that's that's pretty impressive. So congratulations for that. That's amazing. Well, thank you. I think about teachers that you've worked with who have been successful and certainly Jaime Escalante was, was the most famous of those. And one of the things that I see is that when a teacher gets out in front, then other teachers tend to try to cut their heads off because they're doing so much better than them. Can you talk a little bit about that kind of competition among teachers that a lot of us don't really like to talk about, but that exists. And and how do you see that playing out and how do you deal with that? Well, that was one of the situations that occurred. When you see a teacher really going all out and you see it, you see it everywhere. You see it in sports. I had it in art where a teacher went so crazy that she decided to go into AP art. And I gave that person all of the help I could, extra money to take kids to the museum, uh, individual art exhibits that they could see and take part in and exhibit. That teacher was, was getting a lot of recognition and the teacher was getting a lot of, a lot of pluses because of what they were doing and the kids were, were doing well. The grades were well. They were participating with other other individual schools and winning. I'll never forget when they wanted to start chess at Garfield. They said, chess? Well, these kids have a trouble playing, you know, playing Chinese checkers and just what's impossible. They laughed at me. And this teacher came up and said, you know, I can play chess and I would love to start a club. And I said, you got it. What do you need? Well, I need chess boards and what this, that. So I was able to co- collect some money and bought whatever he needed, gave him a nice little section there, and we started a chess club. And I did the same thing with those other teachers that were I, more or less jealous of Escalante. They told me, look, you gave Escalante brand new books, and we've been trying to get books for the last, you know, 10 years, and we still can't get newer books. And you gave him a, a new room. Yeah, there was a room there that we refurbished, and it was an old room that was for guitars, and it was it was tiered, so you had different tiers. Well, that would be excellent, you know, for music, but it was also excellent for Escalante because you could go around the room and, and look at these kids as they were as they were working in different levels. Anyway, they were very upset, so I said, look, anybody who wants to do the same thing, I will back you up with money, with rooms, whatever you need. And I said, listen, all you have to do is improve your AP programs. Add one more AP class 
or add a, we don't have AP chemistry. We don't have AP physics. We have some AP foreign language uh, in Spanish, <laughs> and everybody got an A in that or got a five because they were AP Spanish. But I said to him, why not start AP in the other areas? We have European history, history, Spanish, and now Escalantes. Can we improve on that? How about AP? And, and one said, oh, I'm going to try it. I said, good. I give all the information. They need. AP biology. I hired a lady. I said, you know, I'd love to have you teach AP biology. We haven't had it here ever. She said, well, the regular biology program here isn't that upgraded anyway. I said, well, make it. And she said, well, give me a year. Do you know that not only did she become an AP biology instructor, but years later she was asked by the college board to be a reader for the AP biology college level, and they brought to Washington. And there she read. Imagine the plus in a lady and a teacher being a member of this committee that evaluates and gives grades to what the kids have reported in biology. Then she comes back and starts a biology class. My, her AP classes went crazy and her regular classes improved a thousand percent because now she, you know, you're not going to go back to teaching the basic, basic when you know that this is what exists. Well, then the chemistry teacher said, you know, I hired a pre-teacher said, will you teach chemistry? Again, we'll try. Harvey Mudd sent someone that wanted to teach physics. And we taught physics maybe once every other year. One class, imagine, one class every other year, maybe 20 students. Chemistry was one class for the past something like eight years, nine years. That school had never had more than one class at chemistry. And before it had a class called Chemistry for Nurses, which really wasn't a class that was accredited in college for chemistry. Mm -hmm. The teacher said, I, I said to the teacher, I want you to improve that. Can you start a second and a third and a fourth class? Well, I can unless you improve the math. We got the math going. Do you know that at the end of three and a half years, we had 17 sections of chemistry? 17. That is, and three of those sections were at the college because the kids would go there after school and get, wow. get credit for high school and for college. We were able to get that twice so that we get double credit kids get credit for high school and they also get credit for the college that they're going to attend yeah so so that you help the teacher i'm just so glad that when i gave this out to the teachers and say improve your ap programs improve your regular programs let's move ahead so we can have better scores when the state tests us i'm so glad that that didn't happen all at once i'm glad it was a science first and then little by little so it took three it had a hit i, I don't think i got it done it had to happen all at once yeah. it was wonderful yeah yeah i believe that that sounds amazing so why is it the ap is so important how did you determine that that was what you really need to focus on here's number one in our school i'm now when i speak this way i'm talking about the barrio schools in east l.a when we had about four thousand kids and we were a three-year high school we started sophomore junior and senior so the junior highs or the middle schools had to put a lot more pressure on the kids to teach them the basics like algebra how can you teach calculus AP calculus in a three-year high school if the kids haven't had some kind of algebra and trigonometry or, or, or geometry early. It's a five-year program. Anybody knows you can't, you can't do it. You've got to have algebra and geometry, then algebra two, then usually have trigonometry or math analysis or something. Then finally you get the pre-calculus calculus. And so when I saw this and I saw the people, our kids were going into college, and yet they had, they had four of the five essential items that colleges want. They were poor, poverty, they were Hispanic, Latinos, you know, minority, they were women, they were in young girls, their families, many were not only poor, but there had been a lot of breakups in the family. It wasn't a, a, a straight 100%, you know, nuclear family. They also had uh, a lot of individuals in the barrio, rough spots, people in jail. And, and so I said, my gosh, your kids have all the pluses. The thing that's lacking the most is you don't have the courses, you don't have the classes, you don't have, you don't have that thing that'll get you in. Once we started pushing algebra, geometry, whatnot, that made it much easier for the, how are you going to get 17 sections of chemistry without, without having enough math? Everybody knows that chemistry is based on, you have to have the math, you have to know how to balance the equations. In physics, not only do you have to know, where, you know, the bullet that's, that's fired, the reaction that uh, th Newton's third law or whatnot, and, and you just don't have to understand that basically in just motion, you got to understand the, the action that's facing that bullet, the pull of gravity, the resistance of air. Once these kids got this, then they had the last thing that the colleges wanted. And once, Wellesley. Wellesley never in a million years ever came to Garfield to look for young girls for their college program back east. 
Why would? Why should they? There was nobody that was qualified. Nobody had any college level. Finally, in one of the years that I was there, my second before I left, Wellesley picked up five full scholarships for the for the four years there. And that was amazing. Why? Because the kids had all the prerequisites to go to college. They faced all the worst conditions possible in the barrio. And they also had the education, the background, the training. And most of them had three to four AP courses under the under their belt and were taking the last ones as seniors. That's important. Yeah, wow. So I think about this idea of, you know, dual credit and taking AP and things like that. And we're working so hard to do that still in education. In my school district here in Alaska, we are struggling to get the college to recognize our high school kids for getting credit. And why is it still taking us so long to get to this point that we know is so successful or was so successful at Garfield High School? Well, I think the biggest reason is the concurrent instruction. For instance, we had students that were taking high school courses, chemistry and whatnot. When they went to college, they're still assigned to the high school. They attend minimum credit days for the attendance so they get you know the the full full value for being in school a minimum of four days four four hours a day they finish those four hours and then they report to the nearest college that we have there we had quite a few colleges you know we're in la so they report to a community college or a college for that afternoon and they do this on a regular basis and they take college courses you know that, that was the key and those college courses that they took are college level courses dealing with because these kids were already up to that point. So I put almost, uh, well, I say 200 students from Garfield as juniors, 11th graders, and I put them into that program. And when they went into the, the college, they got courses in college for college credit, obviously. But here's the problem. At that time, they said to me, the kids cannot get high school credit for graduation for these courses because they're given at the college. And they either either take high school credit or they refuse the high school credit and get college credit. And they said, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, the kids are taking college level courses. They said, well, the kids have got to make a decision. The credit either goes to the high school or it goes to the college. And so you know what I did. What do you think I told these kids that they should do? 100%. I said, you take this type of credit. What do you think I did? College credit. Yes. Because yeah. there isn't a college in the world that's not going to take another college's credit for saying this kid attended college, took this course in physics, and got an A. And then the high school, I said to them, I'm going to give them credit for that because this is a quarter course. And finally, I appealed to the state. And at that time, the state finally said, we're going to call it concurrent instruction, which means the credit for graduation will go to the high school because they are involved in learning as long as they have four hours of teacher time either at the college with with high school teachers will give that we i fought that we fought that and, and it, it was only the right thing i mean gosh give kids a credit when that started to happen you see that number of kids that said wow i can get double credit for my high school and i can use that for college if you and they did and it worked and finally we went out to 300 kids doing that uh i would if i had been there longer after seven years or so if i'd have been there longer i had that i had the whole school doing this yeah absolutely so is there is there a problem with pushing that college credit down to high school and pushing high school credit down to middle school is there a problem with that it's always, there's, a, there's always been a problem with that people just aren't willing to change you see let me let me, let me show you let me say one thing to me is very clear I did not change one thing at all in the district policy or the state policy involving the education code. Believe me, I changed nothing. All I did was use what was there and embellish it or, or, or change it to a point that the change didn't make that much difference because you had that leeway. And consequently, they look at me and I said, even now, in the state where I'm working in, the laws are there. It's very similar to California. And I say, why don't they use it? You have the power to use that. Oh, no, that will never work. The parents will get too excited. And the industry here will, will jump up and down saying it's not quite qualified. And I said to him, this is ridiculous. It's in the books. Read it. And I show him. I, I bring out the chapter and page and whatnot. It's in the books. I've never changed anything. But all you have to do is be familiar with it. Be familiar that it's available and learn how to use it according mm -hmm. to who you are now. And that's what I did. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that that is something that we in education do not take enough advantage of. I think that we're such rule followers in education that we just want to do exactly by the book and not do anything to like rock the boat and make uh, make anybody think we're going off course. But you know, yeah, but the boat the boat's already being rocked. And exactly, of course. Already, what what more can you do? All you can do is you can stabilize it. But yeah. that's been the biggest problem here. They don't want to do something. They're afraid of doing it because I don't know. It's there. Just go ahead and do it. I've tried things and it works. It works wonderfully. The kids love it. Yeah. Well, the kids they learn what you're doing and they do the thing that. Uh, that they need to be successful and they, they rise to that level. And when they know that you believe in them and you're going to make their lives better, then they're willing to take a chance themselves and do the work they need to. Look, if I have a minute, you know what this uh, gifted program, mm-hmm. most schools have. A, okay. The gifted program is a program where the kids at an earlier age were stamped that they were gifted because of a certain IQ level. Right. And the testing happened in elementary school and even up to middle school or junior high. But the testing doesn't go on in high school. It it hadn't. And um, the very few that might be tested in high school is kind of late to be put into the gifted program because you're marked early enough and you're put in. I saw potential. Escalante saw potential. And many teachers that by now were in Escalante's group saw this potential and told me, you know, we have a gifted program. But it's so meager, so insipid, so it's just ridiculous. There aren't enough kids in there, and surely with a population at that time of 3,600 kids, we should be able to have more kids in the gifted program. But you can't put them in because they don't, they don't have the stamp of approval. So I said to them, I said, well, look, it, I'm going to give them a stamp of approval. I'm going to look at these kids. You teachers, give me a list of the students that you feel can handle an a, a, a gifted program. For instance, gifted in English or in math and whatnot. Please give me those names that you think these kids will succeed if put into this gifted program, which they go into travel, which they, which they move around the, the city and they, they're, they go hear lectures and they, they go to hospitals. I mean, please, I got a fantastic list from about a dozen teachers, really. And I, I looked at that list and obviously many, many names were repeated. So I came up with a list of something like 30 students. And I talked to the rest of the staff. I talked to the dad. I'm putting, putting next semester, these 30 students are going to put into gifted classes. But they don't have the stamp of approval. See? Yeah. And I said, don't worry. I have a stamp. And I put a stamp of approval there. And I said, here's the thing. I'm going to put these kids in your classes with the gifted kids. And I'll, I'll keep to the level. If we need more gifted teachers, we will have them. So you don't exceed the number. But if any kid, after you've given them a fair shot, doesn't meet meet up, won't do it, doesn't do the homework, let me know and I will remove immediately. And you have that. I give that teacher in writing and said, keep it in your back pocket. This means this kid can be moved out on your say-so whenever you feel he ain't going to make it or he's causing problems. Do you realize that when that occurred, in the years that it did, not one teacher ever used it? Yeah. But one teacher did turn me into the state. Yeah. And they said, this is illegal. You cannot do this. The state came down with some wonderful individuals. They checked my program. They stayed there for a couple of days, really checking everything. And they came out with a a ruling. And they said to me, your program is working very well. We've talked to the students. Yes, you have kids in there that are not gifted by record, but they're doing as well as the other kids. So this is what we are going to say. And they said it and they put it in writing. As long as you have 51% or over of gifted kids that have been, you know, labeled gifted from the beginning, and you have at least 51% or over, then the other 48 or 49% could be anyone you want to put in. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was the first time in the whole LA, in the district, in the, in the state of California, this was the first school that allowed kids to come in because the teachers had said they would succeed. And, and you have to do this. You have to do something. You have to bring it out. Let it go to court. Yeah. I've went to court several times. It's important. You know, I I feel so much justification for how I've been acting at my school and saying that we should give these opportunities to students rather than hold them out in front of only the kids that are anointed as as gifted and that kids will 
if we give them a chance and we give them the stamp of approval, they will likely rise up to that and we won't need to take them out. And, you know, it's so frustrating to see when people have low expectations of kids because of whatever reason that they're Hispanic or African American or whatever it may be or poor or whatever. Kids can learn amazing things and do amazing things. And your experience is, is exactly proof of that. I'm at a middle school right now as a principal. And so I'm working with kids. We don't have access to AP courses at the middle school level and neither do elementary schools. How do we implement some of your strategies at a lower level so that kids are ready for that when they get older, even if our high schools are not doing the things you're talking about? Yeah, this is going to be the biggest, the biggest challenge. If the, the schools the high schools don't have some of these programs or they're not that as active as they should be, then what you're doing is you're, you're moving kids up in an area and you don't have the say to them, hey, once you get to high school, this is going to be available and then from there, it'll get you into a university or a college or some other type of, of institution that'll give you a better shot at, at money or whatever. This is why the biggest problem that I had is when Escalante was complaining of the fact that we didn't have enough kids that were coming in prepared in a three-year high school to take it on. So he had to make it to the point that we taught after school. We taught on Saturdays. We brought kids in sometimes during the holiday. Do you know, we never closed down for the holidays two weeks. Can you imagine two weeks in East L.A. closing down because of the, the Christmas holidays or whatever holidays we had? We never closed down. I stayed open. He stayed open. Why? To get these kids up to that level. So if you're dealing with middle school kids, the biggest thing that I suggest is get with the high school to say, look, you're going to have to somehow move in there so when our kids go in there, they don't sit around and go into basic math classes and then work with the kids in the middle school. You can't give them the AP curriculum, but you can sure master it to the point that you can at least get the, the very basics of the curriculum. Here's one thing that drives me crazy. Kids won't take chemistry when they come into the high school because they're afraid of the math. They don't even know how, what, what the formulas are. I've gone down to the middle school and I've gone also down to the primary school. And in third grade and fourth grade, I have kids reciting most of the periodic chart. And you can start early enough. A third grader, a fourth grader, you show them the chart. You don't got, you're not going to explain it to the, the, at the level of high school. But you say, look, that's gold. It's AU for auto. And it's, that's the symbol for gold. We all, everything has symbols. And you show them the symbols. And you teach it. And you bring in a piece of gold. And you bring in silver. And you bring in lead. And you bring in tin. And you say, this is oxygen. And they can see it. And, and you begin to teach them this. And you see, they show where it is on, on the chart. Why? Why is hydrogen up there? Well, it's a gas. And what does that mean? It only has, it's a molecule. It's, 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 it's one little atom of hydrogen. And you can explain it's a one because it has one proton <laughs> and it has one electron. Does, the only element doesn't have neutrons. Is that that difficult to teach the third and fourth graders? No. And if this would continue grade by grade in the junior high or in the middle school where you have them, it should be mandatory that not just in a science class, that five minutes be given to English. Let me give you an example. At Garfield High School, we had a bulletin. At that time, we didn't have the emails and computers. And every teacher received a, a bulletin for the days of, a day schedule in their box. At the top of that bulletin, there was a problem. So I assigned the math department one month of putting, on a daily basis, a problem in a math, usually algebra or geometry. Like, for instance, if this isosceles triangle, isosceles triangle has the apex angle of 80 degrees, what are the other two angles? Well, you know that triangle has to have 180 degrees in the triangle. If it's isosceles, then the two sides are equal and the two angles are equal. So if it's 80, <laughs> to be 180, and they're equal, each one has to be 50. This is not beyond the comprehension, sir, of a kid in junior high, believe me. Yeah. But if you wait until the kid's in the ninth grade or 10th grade to even introduce this while his computer is running around in his hand, it, it's sick. So Escalante and I would teach this to these kids early enough so they not only get the interest, but they would know this. They would love it. They would be prepared. We have contests. We have contests who can solve this program. The second month, the English department would put things down. Guess one of the questions that, was, that killed us on the test of basic skills in the state of California. It was an English question was, how many lines in a sonnet? 
Now, why would they put that? They say this is ridiculous for East LA kids. No, this was this was a, a question on the CTBS on the test that given by uh, California Test of Basic Skills, a comprehensive test. This was the question that was asked of every senior in the state of California on that test. How many lines in a sonnet? Knowing that all kids must have taken one in their semester or in their in their year of English one portion of of Shakespeare, of Hamlet, of what he saw, of Shakespearean English that was mandated. What I found was that eighty percent of the kids in Garfield High School never took any at all any uh, instruction in Shakespeare. Why? Because they were in remedial courses. And so what I changed, and you have to show this to the principals, if a kid is having problems in remediation in English or whatnot, give them the remediation. But right next to it, the following hour, give them the regular class that by law he has to have. So every kid had English Yeah. Mm -hmm. that by law he had to have because of the state required it, which, show, which showed Shakespeare. And if he was below reading level, an extra course in what? An extra course in remedial reading. So he didn't miss out on how many lines in a sonnet. Oh, see, it w and it wasn't wrong because he was getting the instruction, but he was getting also the instruction to beef him up. And same thing in math. Do you know what that does? That kills a kid with two extra hours that something has to give. What do you think gave? Football, arts, music. Then you have to take P.E. If I found out the law says they only need two years of physical education in a three-year high school. And consequently, health, for instance. You didn't have to give them health as a, as a beginning student. You give them health as a senior. So the things that started happening was that these kids wanted out of those ridiculous programs to be able to get their electives. Well, baby, the only way to get out is to pass that course, let the teacher give it okay, and that's it. At the end of two and a half years, from, from, from a massive amount of kids having that, we were just down to one class in, in, in English and one class in math that was remedial double periods. Because the kids know, you know, and, and, but everybody's afraid to do it. You know why? Because I got sued. Because a parent came to me and says, my son plays the cornet and he's going to join your all city band, which we had a tremendous band. And you're not allowing him to take that band in the morning to play at the football games when he plays on the mariachis because his parents were all involved in playing musical instruments. They were mariachis. They'd sing at weddings and funeral, you name it. They sang everywhere. And this kid was not able to join the band. Why? Because he was taking English and math. I was sued on that. The superintendent came out and said, you can't do this. And I said, yes, I can. Here it is in your own writing. Everything will be done to move a kid through the grade level with the goal of graduation. And if he's behind, then the school has to make it appropriate so that the kid will graduate. It was there. I said, well, that fine. Not he stays. Guess what happened? The kid not only got out of there, <laughs> but was able to, to enjoy it and tell other kids. He went back to the junior high the next year and said, you know, Gradillas, ego, get you. You better get your courses now or you're not going to play art. You're not going to play football. <laughs> Honestly, I swear to you. And, I oh, believe it. Oh, and, and the kids all said, okay. You know, a kid teaching another kid or working, it, it's the best. You know, a kid will turn everybody off, but uh, he won't turn his friend off. But the friend says, you better watch it. That yes is waiting for you. <laughs> and the teachers in the junior high said, wow, you're doing more to improve the academics of the school here than, and I said, I want to hear it. I don't want to compete with it. I'm the principal of Garfield, and that's it. I'll do all I can to help you. But as you help, as I help you, you're increasing the knowledge of these kids, which is helping us to, to give them the, those courses that are going to be necessary in the length of time we have. That, to me, was amazing. Yeah, that that is amazing. You know, one of the things that I think about with that is, you got sued and you can laugh about that now, but that's a pretty scary thing to go through. How do you deal with that in the moment when those things are, are happening? And how do you stay strong and stay committed to the course and don't get scared by the naysayers and the negative people who are trying to bring you down? I know because you know you're right. Because you know. Exactly. Exactly. You know, yeah, you know, you know that the kids are the ones that are going to benefit from it. You know, everything you see, you bet the kids benefit. 
There's one place where they told me, you're taking the food from the mouth of our kids because my kid works on Saturdays and you're having him, forcing him to come in on Saturdays to do the makeup work because he's not, he's failing some of his classes. I said, yes, and that's, that's what I'm doing. And they said, well, you can't do that. And I kept pushing to that point that finally one of them, they brought me before court or something and there was a hearing and uh, I presented my case and they had a, a assistant lawyer or someone that was there. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was a, a hearing. And after I got through my stuff and they got there through, the judge stood up and he said, I am so glad that finally, you know, the principal is doing what principals should do and they get paid for, to run a school and push academics and get these kids through. I'm going to cite for the principal. Do you know once that did, we did it, there was no other attorney that I found anywhere in LA that would take a, a they could take a case against me because they knew, number one, it was all in the books. Now, one of those things was my own. Principals do everything they can to get those kids to graduate, everything they can to stay, stay on course and to satisfy the requirements of the state of California. Chupa! And I did. And that was the only way I could do it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What a fascinating story. Now, what you said that you, you, you said because you know you're right, you say that like it's like, duh, everybody should know that. But when other people say you're hurting my kids' feelings or you're making them feel bad or you're making them not able to work, that hurts educators. How do you teach a principal or a teacher to have that backbone to stand up and say, no, I know I'm doing what's right? One of the things was I allowed the kids to do it. For instance, if a parent would come to me and has and said, look, my kid needs to be specific. I said, my kid needs to work on Saturdays. I said, yes. And what is he doing? Well, he's stocking stuff. I said, we, I said, look, do you realize that if we work with him in math, he's very sharp. He's got a fantastic brain. He can do it, but he's not coming to school because you're also using him probably. You know, you shouldn't. You're probably using him also during the week. And the kid says, sometimes he can't come to school because you have him working. I said, do you realize you're on, you are, and this is heavy. I will regret saying this, but you are on subsistence. You're being paid uh, as a parent for your child to go to school, the lunch money, the this, the compensation. And when you sign that piece of paper, and I have one right here, not yours, but I have a blank one. It says that you will do everything you have to make sure that your student goes to school on a regular basis to be able to graduate. It says right there that you're going to accept this money, and, you're, and what you're going to do on your part is to make sure that you attend school. You're not doing it. So if I was mean, I would just rip it up and tell the state he's not enrolled. And I've done that a couple of times. And, you know, you you write something down that the kid's not enrolled and they're getting subsistence and help and whatnot from wherever. And he's not enrolled because, to me, the definition of enrollment, you see, that's it. He's enrolled. I bet you that 100% of the principals or most of them will say, if if they ask him, is Jones enrolled? He'll, they'll look up in the Rolodex and say, oh, yes, he's enrolled. He signed in the 3rd of September. But he never came back. Now it's, yeah. now, now it's uh, you know, January of the next year, and he never came back. But they keep asking, is he enrolled? And so what I've done is I changed it, and I said to the state. And the state came back to me and said, your definition of enrollment. In fact, I have it somewhere in my office here. That's, a, well, that's one of the finest statements I have ever received in my life. I don't want a certificate for this. What I wanted is the state to say, your definition of enrollment will be accepted. And my definition of enrollment was you are enrolled in the school, pursuing an active course of study that would lead you to graduation. And if you're not, then you're not enrolled. <laughs> Do you know what this did to the school, to the district? <laughs> the parents were bringing kids in that I've never seen before, and they said they, they didn't want to lose it. And look at this. Of the five people that I said they weren't enrolled, and they lost their AFTC or whatever, two of them got it reinstated. Because they appealed and I signed it, say give it to them. It was okay. And two others left. One went back to Mexico and the other dis they disappeared. They went to other parts of the country. There was only one that stuck it out for a while and then left. So notice what happened. It was just the fact that yeah, I was bad. I was mean. I was I was threatened. You, you of all people, they said to me, you're Hispanic. You make the sign of the cross. You go to the corner store that we all go to and have tacos and enchiladas. You speak our language and you're hurting us more than an Anglo would. We'd be better with an Anglo-Saxon principle. I said, yeah, because he'd be afraid because he would let your kid water and all this. He'd let you play around and keep him out of school on Saturdays and maybe Fridays or whatnot. I'm not going to do it. 
You know, once this started and the kids started coming to school and the grades started to improve, do you know I would let kids come in on, on during the, remember I told you, during the holidays, we also had classes, but right before the holidays, a lot of colleges let their kids out for Christmas or whatever. I'd invite them to the school. Here in some schools, they kick, they kick them out. They have guards say, you can't come in. Yeah. I would invite every college kid to come in and talk to the teachers and talk to the kids. That last week before vacation was fantastic. We'd have hundreds of kids come in and say, this is college. Boy, you better get with it. I mean, come on, you have college kids that are coming that are coming to the school talking about college, and they talk to the parents. I had one mother come to me and apologize because she says, you know, my daughter's in college doing quite well. She's working for a professor, and now she comes here, and she, she's making my, my son, you know, tote the line. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you don't do it, I'm telling Gradias. So all of a sudden, the kids are the ones that, that, that it'll get you out of trouble. You know, you can't afford the kids. And all you're doing is giving them a chance. All those college kids, those that went to Wellesley, can you imagine them coming back? One of them quit. One of them only stayed the year of the five and didn't like it, didn't like the atmosphere. Mr. Mr. Family, Mr. Mr. Foods, she came back and she felt very bad. I talked to her and I said, don't feel bad, you're good. Guess what? <laughs> that next semester she was accepted at UCLA. <laughs> Oh, perfect. <laughs> well, why, why would UCLA turn down uh, a B student that got B grades and all this stuff from Wellesley? Come on. Yeah. And she's very happy, and she got her degree. Oh, I would love to give you all the emails that I get from, from kids. There's one Guatemalan girl that didn't that was very shy, and I said, you know, open up. You got so much talent. She's now a CEO of a mercantile company in San Diego working with the Mexicans, uh, trading stuff, and with China. And she learned French. She knows English. <laughs> and she says, wow. this is fantastic. And I got a letter from her saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. All I did was push her and, and, and open the way and clear the path for her so that she wouldn't stumble. Later on, she found out how to clear the path for herself, obviously. CEO of a multi-million dollar corporation? I mean, as for a kid that didn't like herself and was from Guatemala or someplace and was discriminated against, I said, you know, because just because you're Latino, you got the discrimination there too between the Latinos and the Puerto Ricans and the Cubans. You know, there's always some kind of mm -hmm. where you come from. But yep. you know, these are successes. Now this girl will pay it back. We'll come to the school and give lectures and we'll say, this is what we want. But some, some schools don't want them because, you know, they're demanding too much. And then the kids complain because, well, we don't have it. The last thing here on this, I mandated algebra for everybody in high school when I was principal of Birmingham High School in the Valley in L.A. And I said, These, you should have had it before. Algebra is a basic. It's a mandatory course. And once you take algebra, you go, in, you go into the second part of it, and I'll help you all I can. And the kids complain and ran and ran and ran. It was, I was there for, for four years. I left the school four years, moved to Michigan. Anyway, this I went back to visit the school about a year later. I saw this one girl, Lisa, and she was senior. And I said, how you doing, Lisa? How's your math? And she looked at me, she said, I'm not taking any. As a senior, you're not taking math at schools? No. How'd you do in algebra? She says, that's the last course I took. Cause it, was it was required by you, but it isn't required. Algebra, geometry isn't required as graduation, at least not then. And I said, that's terrible. What about the other kids? Well, you left and we all dropped out of it. We don't want to take that stuff. You really, it was amazing. I'd have forced them. And they would have been, I think, better off because they would have had the tools available to move on. Now they got to go. Now it's worse. Now they got to go to what community college and pay. I, yeah. I'm arguing. Yeah, you got to pay. It's going to take time, effort, energy for courses that you could have in high school. Why can't they think of that? When you prevent a kid from taking a course because either you don't think he can do it or because the course isn't available, you're giving him then a, a negative on life. And when he finally grows up, because they do, a spark changes once they're 18 and 19, you know that that's going to change. My own kids changed. I couldn't, understand, I couldn't think of They change. They begin to understand. Once they begin to change it, wow, I'm missing education. They're going to have to go to a community college and spend two years. And what are they going to take? <laughs> they're going to take algebra, geometry. They're going to start taking all those courses that they could have had free and they didn't have to pay for. And they, and they could have had it without having to have the hassle of another two years.
Why can't why can't principals see that and mandate this stuff and and go to jail go go to not no jail but go, go go to the jails and see the people there and what they're doing and say what happened? Talk to them and say what was your biggest downfall? And you'll see most of these young kids that are there the biggest downfall. And nobody cared, and and nobody really pushed them and let them go. So they did the bad things. That's the only way they could find approval. Kids want to be approved. They want to be liked. They want to be able to shine. So give them that opportunity. Not in the in the illegal stuff that the others do because that's what they do and entice them with drugs and drugs. But, but do it in the legal stuff. Do it with the arts and the music. Oh come on, and this is your job. I was told once by a commander, and this is what happened. Oh, there was also the same thing in the, in the picture, Patton. When you're in command, command, you know, or, or get out and do the best you can. Get close to the line. Get close to the edge. <laughs> kind of shove it a little bit. Rub against it so you know what it is. It's not that It's not that heavy. I rubbed against the line that I was supposed to cross, and all of a sudden the thing crumbled. <laughs> was it my fault? I just crumbled. So I just went a little bit, cleaned it up a little bit, and now it was one foot the other way. Nobody knew. Nobody cared. Yeah, I imagine that one of your frustrations and one of my frustrations is that colleges are now saying that there are hordes and hordes of kids that are unprepared for math in college and reading. And so they have to take a remedial course their first year of college. And I, I'm sure that that just makes your blood boil like it does mine when they not only do they have to pay for the classes they could have taken in high school, but then they have to take remedial classes to be prepared for the college level. That's right. We're, we're not doing our job as we should. I'm not saying we don't do the job. We do the job. We do more. We got a lot of problems. Don't don't worry about it. But we should be doing our job 100%. What has to be done, regardless of the the, the roadblocks. Remember, they kept, they kept putting roadblocks in front of me. I was a military man. I was an officer. I had the captain, regular army, airborne, ranger, green beret. And we were supposed to do something in a tactical situation. And, and there was a tree or something in the way. I didn't stop. I was supposed to take a hill with my men, and all of a sudden, I needed artillery support. And I asked for artillery support, and I didn't get it, because that was the problem. I didn't get it. So most people just charged the hill and got all their kids killed. No. I searched. Before I sent my guys out there with no artillery support, I found out there was a platoon of tanks not far in the woods that were on, on reconnaissance or something. And I called the leader, and I said, look, you got five, five tanks there, and you got some, some artillery reserve. Can you attack this hill at 1,200 hours? Just do all the heck you can. You can reach them there. Move, move to defilade positions and fire. But at 12 o'clock, I want that done. The guy says, hey, I got the ammunition. I can do it sure enough. And I use the tanks. You got to use what you have or what you, what you don't have. Look for it. Our, one guy said, well, my hands are tied. <laughs> I love yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm tired of suckers. Huh? How did they get tired <laughs> in the first place? I, you know, no, we got to do the job. We just got to do it. And if you're afraid, listen, how many times were, I told my wife, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go back to school because I might be fired or changed or moved. Mm -hmm. And do you know that I had to change one thing and I refused to because it was against this district policy. But then somebody said, well, because because it's district, I have a right to change it. And I said, no, you don't, because this is state and you're just the, the kind of city. So I said, I'm not going to change it. And things the rule stands. It's on, on moving kids and accepting kids. And so he said, then what we're going to do is we're going to move you for a week, transfer you someplace else, move a principal in there, and he'll, you know, get rid of it. Then we'll bring you back. And I said, go ahead. But let me tell you one thing. <laughs> the instant you move me out, first of all, I won't go back that way. And secondly, you're going to have the biggest lawsuit in your life because you're depriving me and you're illegally doing this. So it's your move. But the order stands. And he must have checked somewhere because the order stood. He hated yeah. me. But that was my job. It was for the kids, not for him. Yeah. Well, that, that speaks great courage to principals who are, are constantly in that situation. This has been a great conversation. I think I could talk to you for hours and hours. But my last question for you, Henry, is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal like you are? Do this week in, in school? Yep. I think one of the, the biggest things that, that can help a principal, and I'm going to go to those individuals that help the kids, because you can help the kids all you want, and you can do it, but it's not easy. We have so many. But what if you go into a faculty meeting, and you have everybody there, 
and you have a, a nice meeting, and you don't say faculty, but you say faculty and supporting staff. That means the custodians, the janitors, because they did so much to bring that school together. You know, they would tell a kid, you pick that paper up, and they knew that that order came from a custodian, but they knew, also knew that that order would be enforced because that custodian would come to me. And so if a principal has a meeting, one of these meetings where everybody comes in, it's a nice meeting, you know, have cookies and, and, and punch and stuff, and then say to the teacher, say to the entire staff, say, you know, we're working hard, we're trying to move our kids in this direction, we know the problems, and you, you don't have to list them, I think they all know what some of the problems are. But say to the teacher, staff, and say, oh, give me one thing, just write it down that I can do to help you and make your your stay here, make your teaching more effective, not easier, more effective. For the custodial staff, make your jobs uh, more effective so you have you don't have to sweat it as much and be hurt. One thing that I can do to improve the the whole business here, one step that I could do starting this week, immediately, that I can do right now. You tell me something, like this teacher once said, I need a munition blind. That night I took it down, had somebody come in. We had some extra ones, put it on there, and that was it. I didn't have to worry about it. She was so amazed the next day that her munition blind was up. And she wrote me a letter, and she said, the reason my munition blinds I were so important because I show movies there, and I show very, very explicit ones, little short ones, and we need to have the room darkened. I said, your request was there. Do you know the, the brownie points that I must have gotten from that teacher? Not just because of what she said to me, but what she said to her staff, her friends. So that's what I said. Give me one thing that I, as your principal, can do immediately. Secondly, give me one thing that I can do in the longer run, let's say two months from now, that you need, really need, but it's not critical. It's it, it's something that's necessary and you want the next two months. And the third thing, give me something that you need that really would improve what you're doing and make a better, better job of it for next year or next semester. Something that I could think about right now and I have right now, what is it, maybe six months between now or we're now in March, mm -hmm. so April, May, June, and then, you know, things that I can take care of in the next six months by September. If you can do that, I'll look at them. I'm not promising you anything, but I am promising you that I'll look at it and some will be done, as I say, and we'll work on this. Now, you keep in mind those things that you've asked me that you want right away within the next few weeks at the end of the year and see what you can do to when I come to you, to work with you in, the, in these areas, what you can do yourself to move it along a little bit. I know you've tried. But now you know you have health. Now you know I'm going to bring the bulldozer, baby. So that little shovel that you have there, you know, you could you, you use it to scrape off. And I'm bringing the bulldozer. So if you want to move a little bit more, if you want to move the plants out of the way that are going to be crushed over because of your request, do so. Prepare for me to make the changes you are requesting. And that's it. And I did that to my staff. I did it at the very beginning when I first got there. And... Uh, you should see the things that they asked. It was amazing. But <laughs> the things they asked, number one was, uh, I won't say it now, but number one was almost unanimous. <laughs> the things they wanted me to do immediately were unanimous. And it wasn't discipline. It's amazing. Well, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> really, the, the, the biggest thing that they wanted was attendance. They said, we cannot do our job if the kids aren't here. If I have, one teacher said, I have 32 kids. And on Monday, I only had 25. On Tuesday, I had 22, but I had two of the other ones that were here at Monday gone, and somebody else was there. On Wednesday, I had almost all the kids there. On Thursday, I had a, a whole diff new complement of kids. Some were still out. Some that were there are now out. Some that were out are now here. She says, I'm teaching this English class, and there's no way. And then a kid comes in that was out two days or three days the following week, and he's missed it. Now he's sitting there wanting to do some makeup, or he's not ready for the test. He says, give me a straight bunch of kids that you have that I don't have to worry back and forth, and I can promise you a, a better prepared lesson so that I can get most of these kids to where they have to be. And that was number one. And that was immediate. And that she wanted the next day. So I started looking at it, and uh, and we started changing. 
I started looking at attendance. That's when I started talking to the parents. And I started saying, you know, you don't, you don't bring your kid here. You're going to have a problem. But that was the, the number one thing. And the attendance did improve. We went from about 60, 72 percent daily attendance in a matter of a year and a half to 97, 98. Kids were yeah. coming into school, really, because they knew the consequences. And so when I asked these teachers on this, I said to them, I said, you will become a say. Here's another thing. For the longer run, uh, they, I, they, I said to them, look, you know that by law, you only can have 32 kids, or let's say 30. 30 is what the union says you have. Do me a favor. Take 33. Oh, we can't do that. Wait a minute. Take 33 kids. Because you know that the 30 that you have now in September, by June, it'll be down to 25. You have lost five kids through yeah. attrition, through whatever they went. Okay. Now, let's say you take 30, 33, three more or 34. At the end of the year, you will still have lost the five kids, but now you'll be a little higher up. You, you, you know, you'll be at 31 or 32. And, uh, so the average will still be what the union says. And this is the promise I give you. And, and I said this because I had money from banks and 100,000 100, from Arco. Coca-Cola gave me 100,000, 50,000 in two years. Um, anyway, I said to them, if you take three or four more kids from what you should have, you know at the end of the year you're going to lose them. However, if you take them, I promise you, I will not add another kid to your class the entire school year. And that was, I will not put another kid into your class at all for the next school year. So the 33 or 34 you start with, you will keep to the end of the year, less those that drop out. Hmm. The union said, I can't do that. It's, I said, look, Ralph, you and I, let's call it a pilot program. Well, I got to get approval. I said, no, wait a minute. It's a pilot program. You approve it. I approve it. We put it up on the board. The teachers, see what they say. Well, he came back with, the teacher said, wow, if we don't have to accept a kid, like there would be kids coming in from other schools, kids coming in from Mexico, kids coming in from the orchards after picking the tomatoes or whatever they were picking and peaches. Yeah. And, and, and they'd get, I said, no, I'll take care of those kids. I have enough funds to buy special teachers to work with the kids that, that are going to come in whatever the problem is that you will not get another kid and that promise was kept you would unless it was pe they wanted a, a sports guy that came in from another school and, and he was a football player and he was yeah then know. they wanted him right <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know those that wanted him i wasn't going to be but if you don't i'm there put anyone un involuntarily that was a godsend those teachers i'm telling you they said that was that was so fantastic they were able to live with that and the attendance grew to the point that they did their job see i made it more effective for them to do that which by law they had to do it was my responsibility they're the ones that do it i just had to find ways and some of them were pushing like i say but i had to work with a union rep do you know that the next year <laughs> <laughs> that same piece of paper, we just changed the date and we left it because we left it in, in the showcase on uh, the school. We had a big bulletin board that was locked. <laughs> the next year, we just changed the date. It's still a, I think it's probably still there. Pilot program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but look oh. at the benefits. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Henry, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. And maybe we can have you on again because there's so much that we didn't get into that was just fantastic. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Okay, you're welcome. Have a good day. Well, this is one of my longer episodes, and that was a great interview with Henry Gradius, and I think definitely worth every minute of that hour and one minute or however long that was. Really inspiring, and what a great thing to do that he talked about how to be a transformative principal to go talk to your staff and say, what can I do today that will make you better? What can I do in the next couple of weeks or months to make you better? And what can I do next year to make you better? I think that's a great approach. And as I move to a new school next year, I'm certainly going to start out with that and make that something that I can come in and do. Also in the show notes, I put a link to how you can apply for the bestschools.org prize for excellence in education. And you can check that out. And then I also put in there how I increased it attendance at my school that Henry talked a little bit there at the end about. And thank you so much for listening to this. And uh, please share this with others who can be inspired by truly a stellar leader in the field of education who has replicated great success in many different schools. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week. Transformative Principles, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. 
podcast for educators by educators. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com for more great podcasts.